We will continue in worship, I believe. No, we're going to do scripture reading. Good morning, Solano family. My name is Mulia Di Hartano. Today I'll be reading from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32, until Hebrew chapter 11, verse 2. Um, I invite you to open your Bibles and to read together with me. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated, for you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have a need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come, and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. This is God's word. Amen. Thanks, Muliati. Thanks. What a wonderful Sunday morning. Uh, a lot of energy. Love being in the round. Uh, love seeing everybody come in and find, you know, find their seat. They're like, man, should I be on this side? We're so used to being on that side. Um, it's good stuff. Congratulations, all you hardworking students. Um, yeah, it's great, great to be here. Um, my name is Miguel, and I'll try my best. This is my first time in the round speaking, so I'll try my best to turn around. Um, but we are doing something fun this summer. Uh, we are starting a new series, and if it would be possible to put the slides on the top uh, back over here for everybody, including myself, that would be awesome too. And I've got a clicker, so don't worry about too much about uh, advancing. Um, yeah, so uh, part of some of the change that's happened is uh, I was asked to curate a sermon series, and so I, that's really fun for me. I've never done that before, and so for, the, for nine weeks, we're going to spend time in Hebrews chapter 11, and where you're going to spend time with what I'm calling the unlikely heroes or the dark horses of Hebrews 11. And I'll explain what that means a little bit, um, but today, yeah, we're going to, there's a lot of colloquial terms, so if English is your second language, which it was for me, um, there's, yeah, I'll try my best to explain, but underdogs, heroes, dark horses, we'll, we'll explain all that. Um, so, yeah, for the next nine weeks, it's not just going to be me up here. It's going to be a lot of different people. Uh, I'm really excited. I'm more excited about that than I am being up here right now. Um, but, yeah. So, so um, yeah, I don't know about you, but I love a good uh, story, and I love a good story with a good hero. Um, and, and for me, I don't really like the, the squeaky clean heroes with chiseled chins, flawless character, perfect hair, and pedigrees. Uh, I'm talking about unlikely heroes, heroes that are gritty, that are tarnished or ordinary, with character faults and troubled pasts. I love these heroes because they remind me of me, of me and they probably should remind you of you. Um, since the dawn of time, God has been mercifully and consistently entering into the lives of flawed people who otherwise might be considered failures. It's almost like he specializes in taking the weak things of the world and making something strong out of them. And that's good news for us, right? So the legend of the underdog, I think I have, yeah, the underdog. Um, it's not just good news, it's great news. We are part of a legacy that spans millennia. This is a legacy of broken, ordinary people who scripture calls faithful saints who persevered in finishing the race of faith, even though they didn't start that race very promising. 
In fact, they, would, they, were, they were what you would call the dark horses of faith. Now, this, this word, dark horses, um, I didn't know this until maybe a couple years ago. I mean, I'm not that into betting on horses. So, but um, uh, if you were to bet uh, and go to a horse race, uh, the dark horse is basically there's, there's, you always have a predicted winner, right? They have a one horse and their jockey who's, they just like, they look great on the outside. You know, they have a winning record. They're probably going to win this next race. Uh, and they usually have a, a wonderful name like Thunder Wonder. Um, but every, every so often, a horse will come around, and I call him Limping Lolo, <laughs> um, who barely qualified to compete. Limping Lolo is highly unlikely to win. But if he does win, he would have an amazing sweepstakes. Um, this is the dark horse, the horse that nobody should bet on that ends up winning literally against all the odds. And you can imagine the prize money that comes with winning against all odds. So the Bible is filled with these dark horses, people who God proverbially, symbolically, took a bet on, who by faith end up winning their long race of faith. And now they cheer us on to keep us running our race of faith in Jesus, who is our forerunner and our reward. So like I said, we're going to spend the next nine weeks hanging out with unlikely heroes of the faith from Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to hear from and look into the lives of Deborah, which I'm really excited. That's next week, Paul. Um, Samson, uh, Noah, Jacob, Abraham, and Samuel. And by doing so, um, my desire, my prayer is that these dark horses of faith will help us understand God's economy, God's against all odds, God's upside down wisdom in choosing unlikely people to advance his kingdom. So let me set the scene for Hebrews chapter 11. Um, I think there is the next. Oh, yeah. Ooh. All right. So Hebrews chapter 11. Um, before we get to chapter 11, I'll just leave it here. Um, let, let's, let's set the scene. So this is a letter written um, we don't actually know who authored the letter of Hebrews, um, but the author, they were very, very masterful, pastoral, logical thinkers, um, and, and this, this author targeted his letter to a people of Jewish descent, who, who he calls the Hebrews. Um, they lived in an urban setting, most likely, and they are a group of followers of Jesus, uh, most likely of house churches who have been exposed to suffering, imprisonment, dwindling attendance, and whose founding leaders probably had passed on uh, due to death. And being of Hebrew and Jewish descent and culture, this congregation was steeped and aware and exposed to the Old Testament, to the Old Covenant, to the story of Israel. And in fact, many of the congregants, if you read it closely, they felt the temptation to return to the old covenant, to the old ways, to the old traditions, um, because they, they, they were comfortable for them. Um, and because these temptations were strong, the, the author spends his entire letter systematically deconstructing those old covenant things and categories. And he does so by illuminating Jesus as the best and greatest revelation of every Old Testament expression. So to summarize the book of Hebrews, Jesus is, all you, all you brethren people know this, because Hebrews is the favorite. Um, he's a better, Jesus is a better messenger, right? Um, in the early chapters, uh, the author says he's better than the angels. And I don't know if you know this, the word angel in Greek is the same as messenger. Jesus is a better messenger. He's a better prophet. He's more highly revered than Moses. He's the better Sabbath rest. Instead of a, just a day of the week, Jesus actually is the spiritual daily reality of rest. Uh, Jesus is the better mediator because in the old covenant, they had weak mediators, um, but he's a perfect, uh, he's not sin tainted. He's a perfect sinless high priest. Um, he's a better sacrifice who gave himself and becomes what the author of Hebrews calls the one who runs ahead of us. He is the better way, the living way, and one could metaphorically say that he is the OG dark horse, 
the original Dark Horse. So uh, before I get there, uh, remember the Dark Horse doesn't seem like it should win. And why am I calling Jesus a Dark Horse? So let's remember that for the Hebrews, uh, they've been waiting for hundreds and even thousands of years for a Messiah, an anointed king. Messiah means anointed king. They had this ancient primal idea that a mighty king would come and liberate God's people from the Roman Empire and from all the other empires who had been under the influence of the wicked serpent. This this Messiah would crush his head and liberate his people from their own enslavement to sin. We find this all throughout the scriptures, what scriptures calls the law and the prophets. But if we fast forward to Jesus' life, Nobody could have imagined that this Messiah, an anointed king, was going to be vulnerable. That he would come as a human baby. That he would fall into the hands of crooked government, falsely accused by his own people. That he would be mistreated. That he would be beaten, whipped, and punished, and even killed on a cross. Nobody wants a dead Messiah, right? And here within a century of Jesus' death and burial, you can see why the Hebrews may have been tempted to discard their faith because they were not the eyewitnesses of Jesus. They were probably the second generation of faith. And you could almost hear them murmuring in the back, should we really trust in Jesus? Did his resurrection actually happen? Wasn't the Messiah supposed to be a little mightier, a little stronger, a little more heroic. Uh, but the author of Hebrews appeals that the way of Jesus was better than they could have imagined. Better than any political power play, Jesus is subverting everybody's expectations. What Jesus did was more effective than political insurrection. He actually dismantled the powers behind the powers. And the author of Hebrews explains... Since therefore, the children, that's the, the children of, uh, of this new covenant, share in flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. So Jesus is the original dark horse, the OG, who is set up in this letter as the forerunner, the pioneer, the trailblazer. He was perfected through his suffering, and he sympathizes with our weaknesses. Welcome, welcome, y'all. Reasons to come early. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're glad you're here. Um, yeah, so this, yeah, Christ's sacrifice uh, for the sin of all humanity forged a new way forward. And this is a new and living way through his own sacrifice. The pathway of Jesus is unconventional, to say the least. And in many ways, his pathway is otherworldly, even upside down, backwards. A few years ago, Pastor Andrew, as we were studying Ephesians, he called it the J-shaped journey. To go up, you must go down. So uh, a few years ago, about four and a half years ago, Alessia and I took a six-week sabbatical. It was my seventh year at Solano, and I was like, hey, this might be kind of cool. Um, so, so one of the things that we did was we spent a, a lot of time in Colorado, which is a beautiful state, and we particularly particularly loved hiking. I was talking to Erica this morning about hiking. Um, during one stretch of the trip, we stayed in a little town uh, of, uh, that was called Leadville. Has anybody been to Leadville, Colorado? Hey, all right. It's 10,000 feet in the air. It's, I mean, there's like mountains that are, it's not in the air. It's <laughs> the elevation. <laughs> it's elevation is 10,000 feet. And we had such a hard time breathing and sleeping um, but, <laughs> yeah, really, you know, um, they actually sell, like, oxygen packs at the liquor store nearby. Anyways, uh, because it was so high up, thankfully for us, we had a, a head start in hiking a nearby 14er. And then in Colorado, they have these things, they, 
Their mountains are so big, they're like, oh, yeah, we just call them 14ers, you know, because they're 14,000 feet up in elevation. And um, we tried to go to one that was near Leadville. And when we got to the trailhead, there was a fork at the beginning in the road. And being a man as I am, I decided not to use a map uh, against the counsel of my companion. Um, <laughs> And I did not consult with anybody, other hikers there, because the easiest way to climb a mountain is logical, right? You just go up, right? Um, but as we went up, the path got narrower and narrower, and we ended up hiking near the edge of the mountain. You can see here, um, uh, it was steep, and, we, and it was dangerous, and eventually we got blocked by snow. It was snow on the path. So we were sadly not able to get anywhere close to the, to the summit, um, even though we were pretty high up already, you know. Um, and when we went back down to our cars, actually, let me show you this view. Yeah, that was, that's beautiful. Um, so when we went all the way back down, because we had to stop and turn around, uh, we saw people uh, at the summit. And we we're like, how the heck did they get up there? Well, turns out that the little fork in the road went down through the valley and went up and around the mountain. And that's how you're supposed to get up. So um, instead of going up, like Alessia and I did, um, you know, we had to first go down. And I think that this is an unlikely pathway, right? Um, back to the letter of Hebrews, the unlikely path. This congregation, like me, is tempted to abandon Jesus's pathway, the better pathway. Things had gotten really hard for them. And so let's read together the passage that's right before we meet our unlikely heroes of chapter 11. It says this, but recall the former days and this is what Muliati read earlier. But recall the former days, the earlier days, after you, congregation of Hebrews, were enlightened. You endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those who were treated that way. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Sheesh. Since you knew that you yourselves had better possessions and an abiding one. Therefore, don't throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we, Hebrews congregation Solano, are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and preserve their souls. So the author of Hebrews is saying, look, Hebrews, y'all, when you first became believers and you really understood who Jesus was, you got hit with huge trials, huge struggles, suffering, public critique and abuse, even by association. Um, they had their property stolen and they were associated with believers in prison. So he's telling them, hey, don't abandon your faith. Right now, when, when the moments are the hardest, don't throw away your confidence because you will be rewarded. You're going to get and receive what you have promised. You have better possessions and reward waiting for you. And then the author of Hebrews qu quotes this uh, Habakkuk. Um, and so we're going to take a little detour with Habakkuk. Uh, I love the Bible because it's super raw. If you think the Bible is like trying to hide all the imperfections of people, it doesn't. Um, all right. It's real. Habakkuk is a small book in the Old Testament where this guy, the prophet Habakkuk, is complaining. He's crying out. He's lamenting to God. Why do evil pro people prosper in this world? Why do they seem to have it all? Are you fair, God? Are you just? And then God tells him in this little um, quote, he says, wait a little bit longer. I have a special plan with a special person, the righteous one the coming one. I will preserve your soul if you live by faith. Don't shrink back. Don't retreat. This, this word shrink back in, in Hebrews, it's literally of an army retreating in the middle of the war. And so I'm preaching to myself here because um, I have moments of weakness also. Sometimes I ask God and I'm like that prophet and I complain to him and I'm like, God, if we're trying to be faithful to you as a church, why dot, dot, dot? Why are our num numbers where they are? We try to remain faithful to your word and, and, and your kingdom here in Berkeley, so 
Why has our congregation suffered? Why have we said goodbye to so many people over the years? These have been moments of lament for me. And I know many of you feel the same, especially those who have been in leadership, those who have been close to it all. But we are not those who shrink back, those who have faith and preserve our souls. And I, as I was thinking about it this week, I, I actually believe that Solano's best days are ahead of us. Um, we don't have to shrink back. Uh, we must move forward, though, together and not isolated, not individually, for the race of faith is not meant to be run alone. So what about you? Can you relate to the temptation that the Hebrews were facing? Are you tempted to settle down with what you're used to, to fall back on what is comfortable, to take the easy path, not risk taking the challenging step with Jesus? What, what temptations are you facing now? What hardships and challenges are pushing you to the edge of your limits? Don't be afraid because you are in good company. Hebrews 11, or oh, I'm almost there. You're in good company. We're going to spend the nine ne next eight weeks after this one um, learning about this good company. You're not alone um, because we are going to meet our brothers and sisters of faith, the unlikely heroes, the dark horses of Hebrews 11. We're going to learn from them and see how their faith is expressed. And here's what the author says in the next chapter. I'm kind of summarizing some of Hebrews 11 here. It says, these, the unlikely that we're going to meet in the next eight weeks, um, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. They are seeking a homeland. They desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to, to be called their God. What a lovely and amazing phrase. For he has prepared for them a city. Listen to this. The world was not worthy of these. They were wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, they did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us. Now he's talking to the Hebrews that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. I think that's what it says. Yeah. So this is a really amazing passage. Um, it's important that we get to know Samuel and Deborah and uh, all the people that we're going to, to spend time with. Because if you read this carefully, it says they have not received their reward yet. They're actually waiting for us. Now, I don't know how it works in God's economy. I watched the movie, what was that one with the time travel thing? Um, with the tester, tester thing? Where's Rob when I need him? <laughs> I love that movie too. Uh, no, it was the Christopher Nolan one. Tenet? Interstellar. Yeah, that's the one. Interstellar. I, it might be something like that. I don't know how it works. You can, when you get to heaven, you can ask God, how does time really work? But they are, these people, this company is waiting for us. Crazy, I don't get it. But they're, they are waiting for us to finish our journey of faith so that we can celebrate together. They're cheering us on. And so the writer is encouraging his believers to finish well. Don't be sluggish about your faith journey. Imitate those who through, who, through, who, woo, through whom faith and perseverance will inherit the promises of God. As we sang about today, I love that song. Um, so I put together a, a, a practical thing. Okay, this is the Unlikely Heroes Survival Guide, and I need this every day. This is where the practical um, gets real and uh, practical. Um, so the, the Unlikely Heroes, a dark horse survival guide. All right, number one, the promises of God. Always remember the promises of God. In Hebrews, I love one, actually one of my tattoos it was inspired by this. It says that God never lies. And so when he promises something, it's actually set in stone by two things. That one, his character is perfect, and then he never lies. So whatever he says will come to pass. We need to live in the reality of the promises of God. We, we need to take hold of those promises. We need those promises to dwell in our hearts and our minds when we are tempted to go astray. And um, Erica, would it be possible to put 
Let's just sing this together. Verses two through five, three whole verses. Um, we sang it, uh, standing on the promises, verse two. We're just going to sing it a cappella because it's such a wonderful thing. I could preach or we could just sing it together. So it goes, standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Let's try verse three. three. Standing on the promises I now can see, perfect, pleasant, cleansing in the blood for me. Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free, Standing on the promises of God. Verse five, four. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God. All right, last verse. Standing on the promises I cannot fail. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Amen. You're preaching to me. Um, number two. Sorry, we're making you do some gymnastics on the computer there. Uh, number two is the perception. Number two in the survival guide of the unlikely heroes. We talked about the promises of God, the perception. Um, we need to take on heaven's lens. I think this is a powerful statement. Take on the lens of heaven. What does that mean? So for the next eight weeks, you are going to hear about these unlikely people. If you read those stories, and we are going to get into those stories, you will notice that they are Pretty messed up people, most of the part. Maybe, no, even, I was thinking even Noah, yeah. Um, so these people are messed up. And if you told me to summarize their life in a chapter, I would have probably put, you know, the, and they did this, and when they did this. And, but the amazing thing is that the author of the Hebrews, his perce perception is the perception in the lens of heaven. These messed up people are basically, they're venerated as saints. And in the same way that we must understand that at our very worst, because of what Christ has done, because he has finished the work on the cross, and because we are in him, we are his beloved. At our very worst, we are still the beloved of God. Because if we have placed our faith in him, he has completed what we could not ever do. So perhaps you need a perception change to see yourself through the eyes of heaven. And, um, how many of you love, uh, oh, and he knows where I'm going. Um, the Prince of Egypt, how many of you have seen that? Oh, okay, sing along. Uh, so how can you see what your life is worth or where your value lies? You can never see through the eyes of men. You must look at your life. Look at your life through heavens. So the lens of heaven is, look, don't measure yourself by the standards of the world. Don't put your value in those things. Don't look through the eyes of man. Look at your life through heaven's eyes. Number three, we have a prize that is ready. A heavenly city full of the presence of the Lord, the saints, and more. I'm kind of excited to meet the living creatures. Like, um, Brenda had a pin earlier with like a cat with wings. I was like, ooh, is that like a liger or a, or a seraph? I don't know. We sang about it earlier. How cool is that? Um, etern eternal life begins on this side of earth. And when we die, our life will continue in ways that we cannot think or imagine. We look forward to a heavenly city where righteousness dwells where sin and tears will all be gone. We look forward to the presence of God. S imagine seeing Jesus face to face, his love and glory wrapping us in the most indescribable euphoria. I was trying to think, there's nothing that will compare to this, but 
You know, when you're cold and, and, you, and you step outside and the sun hits you and starts to envelop you with warmth, I can't imagine what it's going to be like to see Jesus. Uh, we look forward to being with all the dark horses, the unlikely heroes, our fellow brothers and sisters, the saints and the angelic beings in heaven. So we must live today holding on to the reality that we will receive this prize. God will reward us. In Hebrews it says that anyone who uh, follows God must understand that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. God is a rewarder. And number four, perseverance. Today we can please God by worshiping him through our steadfast living, by persevering today. So um, persevering, we sang it already, leaning on the power of the Holy Spirit who will help us and guide us and lead us. Um, persevering by being courageous. Uh, let's not shrink back. Let's not retreat. Let's keep going. Um, we advance in the race of faith knowing that Christ has already won and live. We get to live in his victory. So today, you might not feel like you're very strong, but God has big plans for you because he has secured the victory through Jesus. Amen. All right, one more sing-along. This one's more obscure, I think. But how many of you know Audio Adrenaline? Oh, okay. Uh, they had an album called The Underdog. Underdog? Anybody? No? Okay, I'm going to sing this one by myself. Well, I'll just quote it for you. Is it up here? Yeah. Because um, it's like there's a bass line and doo -doo -doo. it's kind of not really that singable. Um, but it's, he said, he said, they say they wrote this song, The Underdog. And it says, I'm in this race. To win a prize, the odds are against me. The world has plans for my demise, but what they don't see is that a winner is not judged by his small size, but by the substitute he picks to run the race, and mine has already won. Amen. So we're going to open up our time of prayer and uh, as we take communion today, today's the first Sunday of the month, and we usually have prayer response time. And so these are some of the questions that I have maybe uh, to prompt that response in you. So question number one about promises. What promise do you need to claim today? Which promise do you need by faith to take a hold of and make it your own, to be maybe a theme verse that you carry forever? Um, the second one, perception. What sin or what lie is God wanting you to untangle from? Uh, the author of Hebrews says, therefore, set aside every sin and every weight that, that keeps you from running the race well. What sin or lie is God wanting to, to untangle you from? Because in the, in the lens of heaven, you've already overcome that through the blood of Christ. And we can walk in that liberty and freedom. The third one is the prize. What is God asking you to let go for his better prize? What things are keeping us from seeing that prize fully? And number four, um, who will be your running mates in the perseverance category? Who will be your running mates during this stretch? Um, a, a friend of mine, I think I've said this before, but a friend of mine used that word, yeah, like running mate, because life, ha life is a long journey, all right? And sometimes we have running mates uh, for a season. Sometimes they come, sometimes they go. But for this next season, who are going to be your running mates? Because we can't do it alone. So, um, John, yeah, thanks. Get, you get to lead us in communion. Thanks, Miguel.